So the Empire, I'm, I'm going to be discussing briefly <coughs> large, uh, part of a larger project, much larger project, and I tried to abbreviate as much as possible to fit into the 40 minutes, 45 minutes here. But it is the Ottoman Empire, and especially its legacy in southeastern Europe. Uh, and by southeastern Europe, I'm primarily going to focus today on Albania and Bosnia. So I will start with uh, L.S. Davriano's um, research of the Balkans since 1453, um, who writes that a great deal of the information that we have about southeastern Europe, or, or the Ottoman Empire itself, is on the sultans, <coughs> on the administrators. It is on, uh, it is on the administrative goings-on of the empire, but what we lack primarily is a form of knowledge that is produced by the Balkans peoples themselves. Um, the kind of knowledge of the day-to-day -day goings on under the Ottoman Empire, the kind of knowledge, the stories that, 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 that were produced as a result of this, of this force that came through southeastern Europe. And, and because of this, we have a lack. We have this, this gap in the knowledge of, of southeastern Europe and a silence, if you will. And this became very evident primarily after, um, after the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire, where at the heels of its disintegration, you had these fledgling nation states um, who had these ethnic belongings, these religious belongings, and linguistics belongings, but who didn't have these local stories apart from the empire itself. Or if they did, um, they were not consolidated in the kinds of archives that we do our research today. And so um, I, I put the quote by uh, Michel de Sorteau up there, the fiction is a repressed feather of historical narrative for that purpose, because in the national moment after the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire, uh, we have um, writers from southeastern Europe trying to recover fiction in, in fictional form, in historical fictional form, some of those realities that peoples in southeastern Europe experienced during the Ottoman Empire. I will kick us off with um, this quote from Mesha Selimovich uh, from Death and the Dervish. This is not a novel we will be looking at, but this very lengthy quote here um, encapsulates a lot of the issues and the questions that we'll, I will be raising today. And I will just read parts of it. Um, you can read the, in its entirety on your own here. We belong to no one, and the Dervish writes, he's a Bosnian Muslim speaking to a Western subject. We were always on some frontier, always someone's dowry. For centuries, we've been trying to find, trying to recognize ourselves. Others do the honor of letting us match, march under their banners, since we have none of our own. They entice us. <coughs> Further on, we've been severed from our roots. We live at a crossroads of worlds, a border between peoples in everyone's way, and as someone <coughs> always thinks we're to blame for something. The waves of history crash against us as against a reef. We're fed up with those in power and we've made virtue out of our distress. We've become noble-minded out of spite. You are ruthless on a whim. So who's backward? Several issues that are, are raised here have to do with that precarious position of southeastern Europe and the crossroads of empires. You had the Byzantine, the Roman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, all of these powerful actors coming into the area. And the dervish here especially uh, um, is highlighting the fact that he, as a Muslim subject in Bosnia, has this experience of deracination, right, by, by movements of peoples throughout the region during these imperial movements, but also this self-stigmatization. Where do we belong? Where are our roots? How do we recover them? And furthermore, why, do, why are we called backwards, right? Why are we backwards people when you are the ones who are the ruthless ones stepping all over our land? <coughs> and this highlights the position of South, um, southeastern Europe as a bridge. Uh, this is a metaphor that has been commonly used to describe the area. The bridge between the East and West, the, the, the frontier of, of Europe meeting the, the, the Turkish horde or the Ottoman horde. And so this bridge becomes the metaphor that describes it, but there are several issues with being the bridge. Um, this passage from Eva Andrich in The Bridge on the Drina speaks about the violence, but also the unity that the bridge itself um, creates in the, in the nations of southeastern Europe. It is the bridge in Visegrad, which was bombed uh, during World War I. <coughs> the passage speaks as though it is a lamentation uh, transmitted as an echo through the decades. And so far as the bridge, the inanimate bridge, is the midweb that brings forth communion among the diverse communities in Visegrad. It stands as a symbol of unity. 
but insofar as the bridge becomes the site of contested histories and myth histories, it's a symbol of disruption, division, and even violence. And this metaphor is also problematic on another front, right? A bridge is, as an inanimate object, it's also just a utilitarian structure, imagined or constructed. And insofar as its only utility, what kind of identity does it have apart from joining these two powerful banks? Um, and that's partly what Mesha Salimovich's character in the Dervish, Stefan the Dervish, speaks about. So the bridge of the metaphor serves to discursively erase the identities that are described by it, or at the very least to render them as only utilitarian and in service of those powerful imperial act actors. So this is our starting point uh, with, with the discourse on Southeastern Europe as, as the bridge. And, and, and what I wish to do is to to um, do away with the metaphor in it, in, in it altogether. It is not a met metaphor that allows for a self-representation and then a, a writing of history on their own terms. Um, and so looking at the current events in, uh, in, the, in the region, and particularly with the role that Turkey is playing in trying to, re to reform its, its understanding of the Ottoman Empire, and looking at some of the articles um, about these reforms, on December 16, 2012, a Kosovar newspaper, Yetanda Kosova, published a statement by the Turkish ambassador in Kosovo, Sanu <coughs> Zan, titled Turkish Ambassador's Advice on Kosovo's History. And part of the request of, 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 the, um, of the Turkish ambassador was to revise or to review um, the history textbooks of, of, Kosovar, uh, of, of Kosovar schools from grade three up until 13, I believe. And Ozan emphasizes that the textbooks teach new generations <coughs> attitudes toward history depending on the language and stance of the historian, and that history needs to be written by a collaborative uh, by a collaborative approach, meaning that Turkish scholars and Kosovar scholars, Serbian and Albanian, need to join together in order to rewrite and to, to represent the Ottoman Empire in a, in a different light than it is. And so some of the changes that were highlighted in the report were the words violence and murder. Um, they would be replaced by phrases that would sound like taking away of property or taxing or assimilation of certain segments of local societies. The phrase, the barbaric Ottoman dominion, is replaced with Ottoman occupation. Um, and then in an eighth grade textbook, um, whenever it was, dis it was being discussed, the kind of discrimination that the Christian population in Southeastern Europe um, experienced during the Ottoman Empire, um, that, that particular passage was to be replaced with, in practice, all inhabitants of the regions occupied by the Ottoman Empire um, in everyday life were equal before the law. Certainly, there were those circumstances when local clerks abused their position during the Ottoman Tanzimat reforms, which those reforms were efforts to centralize um, the Ottoman Empire. While Kosovo implemented many of the suggested changes, the committee's work was widely criticized by journalists and writers like the Albanian writer Ismail Kadare, who signed a petition against the revisionist approaches up to Ottoman history in Kosovo. He stated that this is a cultural aggression that hits and the foundation of the nation, which has repercussions for the future of our identity. And you know, the pronoun our there is important. He considers Kosovo as part of the greater Albania. Um, <clears throat> Additionally, the repeated Turkish request for a revision of historical narratives in education indicates a discomfort with the past and its interpretation. Turkey has struggled with its Ottoman past in the face of the dominant Kemalist ideology, but in recent decades, and especially under Erdogan's leadership, there has been a neo-Ottomanist trend in Turkish culture, labeled Ottomania. Thanks to Erdogan economics policies, Turkey has a thriving television industry, writes Elif Batuman, when she discusses The Magnificent Century, which is a television show produced in Turkey. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have watched it. And it, is a, it deals with, uh, with uh, the, the, the time when Sultan, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent was in power, and it took the, the show from 2011 to 2014. Very interesting, highly recommended. Um, the show is a celebration of the achievements of Suleiman the Magnificent and the Ottoman Empire, and the breadth of its influence beyond the Turkish borders, which are reiterated in these kinds of requests. Another report um, by Michael Birnbaum in 2013 um, is titled, Turkey brings a gentle version of the Ottoman Empire back into the Balkans. His remarks primarily focus on Bosnia, uh, where there have been 
Turkish universities that have been built, as well as mosques and, and other centers for learning. Um, but also that there is also an, another um, article by The Economist titled Turkish Religious Diplomacy, Mosque Objectives. And it focuses primarily on the mosque building practices of Turkey around southeastern Europe with the biggest one, um, the biggest funded one uh, being in Albania, the, the, the biggest one in southeastern Europe. So economic growth then is not the only aim because there's a lot of investment by, by the, um, the, the Turkish nation in southeastern Europe. It's also this cultural influence, right, that continues the tradition of the Ottoman Empire in the region itself. So Turkish influence in Bosnia, um, the, the officials say, will create a strong relationship between the two countries, which may help Turkey's European Union bid in the future. Hayruddin Salmoun, a former Bosnian ambassador to Turkey, regards Bosnia as a stepping stone in Turkey's larger goals. The Balkan states was always there, the Ottomans, path to conquering Europe. They had to come through here, Bosnia <laughs> being the here that he's speaking of. And so if beer bombs and the economists um, reports sound alarmist, it is for a reason. Turkey's growing economy and investments in Bosnia, Albania, Serbia, and even Croatia pose important questions for Central and Western Europe. These concerns not only echo the former European discomfort with the Ottoman Empire, but they also solidify the conceptualization of Bosnia, Albania, and Southeastern Europe uh, merely as a bridge or a stepping stone uh, that connects Turkey to Europe. So the present discussion attempts to decenter both this Eastern and Western um, approach to the region and to, and to retain a strictly Euro Eastern European um, vantage point in its analysis of the literary texts. And so in an important step in acquiring such a vantage point is, is to consider Southeastern Europe rather as uh, not as a periphery, but as a province. And I take my cue here largely from Mark Ames' work in, um, titled A Provincial History of the Ottoman Empire, Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean in the 19th Century, where he provides a definition of province that is unlike um, our usual understanding of province, like the Parisian province or Floberian province, right, that where nothing happens, where history never happens, for Ames, the province is different than the periphery, whereas the periphery is part of the empire. It, it's on its edge. It's on, it's on, it's on um, the frontier, if you will. The province is on the outside of the imperial center, but not part of it. And as such, it becomes a provincial center of its own. And so if we consider Southeastern European nations and, and, and these regions that we're looking at as provincial centers of their own, they are no longer so tightly tethered to the Ottoman legacy or tightly tethered to, to the Ottoman Empire. So what we are looking at when we're talking about Southeastern Europe as a provincial <coughs> center, we are looking at a set of relationships not only with the imperial center of the past, but also with the relationships of, of the different ethnicities and religions in the region itself. <coughs> And so rather than, than looking at the map, we're looking at these relationships, the dynamics between them, and how they shape the nation itself. Okay, so I'm going to shift now um, to discussing the texts under question, or the, the authors under question, the first one being Eva Andrich, um, who was, um, his, his, he's a Yugoslav writer, um, Yugoslav no longer, uh, he was born in Travnik, which is present-day Bosnia, and he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1961. Um, a lot of his works focus on rural or, or very isolated towns in Bosnia, and he, um, he painstakingly describes the, the, the daily lives of people. As we talked earlier, the archives miss these day-to-day -day interactions between the different communities, and so Ivo Andrić kind of recovers that um, that lack in the, in the historiography of this particular area. And he does so uh, by, by looking at the bridge itself, which he always thought as Bosnia as the bridge between the east and west, of a metaphor that we're trying to undo here. Um, but at the same time, his work was focused um, very insistently on archival research, and, and a, a great deal of his writing was based upon what was found there. And this uh, archival research uh, attempted to recuperate a large tapestry of historical <coughs> circumstances, and they depicted Bosnian identity that was buried beneath layers of imperial <coughs> histories, intertwined and often forgotten. 
So staging stories in the Ottoman imperial presence in remote Bosnian towns that appear to have no worldly significance, Andrzej's historical novels insist on the crucial role of provincial territories or provincial centers, as we said earlier, of empire as hybrid cultural locations. Although Andrzej's works are Yugoslavian um, and seek to represent the heterogeneity of the regions they depict, it is inevitable to view his work as mainly concerned with Bosnia, its development, and its identity. Because what concerned and interested him more about in, his, in all of his creative work was the experience of Bosnia as a borderland, when, where East meets West, to <coughs> the experience to belonging to a Christian community that had been for centuries subject to an administration based on Islam. So he, he felt that marginalization in the Bosnian community um, as, a, as a Christian. Within Bosnia itself, Andrić is a divisive figure. In 1992, at the start of the Bosnian genocide, Murat Shabanovic, a Muslim man, destroyed the statue of Andrić that stood <coughs> in Visegrad by shattering its head with a hammer and throwing it into the Drina, which is ironic, right? This is novel. It's titled The Bridge on the Drina. In November 2013, Rusnir Mahmoud published a scathing critique titled Andrićism, an Aesthetics for Genocide where he claims that Andrzej's works inspired the anti-Muslim that fuel, the anti-Muslim behavior and, and, and attitudes that fueled the Bosnian war. Mahmoud Chahayev <coughs> claims that Andrzej's representation of Bosnian Muslims as Turks and Turks as Bosnian Muslims makes Bosnian, Bosnian Muslims a direct target for non-Muslim factions of society by virtue of associating them with the Turks. So many instances of interchangeability between Bosnian and Turk can be found in Andrzej's texts. For example, in the bridge on the Drina, Andrzej uses the following labels, both Turks and Christians, which indicate Bosnians and <coughs> Serbs respectively. So the Turks are Bosnians and Christians are always Serbs. Um, another instance he writes, as the struggle in Serbia grew, more and more was demanded from the Bosnian Turks. Right, so that the, those ethnic terms are interchanged. Here the author places both labels next to each other, implying that the term Turk is a necessary modifier for Bosnian, thereby tethering one to the other. In another instance he writes, but in the homes not only of the Turks, but also of the Serbs, nothing was changed. <coughs> Andrzej uses interchangeability of ethnic label with the religious one. Serbs are often referred to as Christians and Bosnians either as Muslims or as Turks. The latter is especially important in light of the criticism launched at Andrzej about the effects his attitudes on Islam had on genocidal ideologies in the 1990s post-Yugoslav conflicts. Addressing this problematic usage of labels, the translator for the 2015 edition of Bosnian Chronicle, which was formally titled in English, The Days of the Council, Joseph Hitrech writes, the Bosnian uses usage of name Turk to denote a Muslim of local origin and domicile has been retained in this translation. Thus, Turk may mean either a member of the ruling Osmanli race, which were the elites of, of the Ottoman Empire, or a Bosnian Muslim, usually of Slavic origin, whose ancestors became converts to Islam. Using Turk for a converted Bosnian as well as a, for Osmanli positions both groups as cultural equal culturally, uh, ethically and religiously, which not only alienates Bosnian Muslims, but it equates them with the occupying Osmanli, the oppressors that must be defeated and overthrown. Discursively, these labels are pernicious and warrant the criticism that is leveraged against Andrzej in post-Yugoslav times. As a result, critics argue that Andrzej's narratives have been used by nationalist ideologies for their war against Bosnian Muslims, which led to the siege of Sarajevo in Bosnia and, and, and in the 1990s. Another prominent Bosnian critic, Muxin Rizvic, too, criticizes what he claims to be Andrzej's negative portrayal of Muslim characters in his work. Celia Haxworth herself, who is one of the most prominent critics on, on, um, on Andrzej, uh, argues for a separation of the writer from his novelistic characters who display beliefs about and attitudes toward being Bosnian, Serb, Turk, or European. She emphasizes that Andrzej's writing does not reflect his beliefs, but merely his observation of human life in Bosnia. Being born into a Catholic family has positioned Andrzej to view religious relations in a particular way, which may be perceived, she says, as inflammatory by the Muslim population. 
And so when she discusses Brisbich's criticism, which is titled, uh, the book is titled The Bosnian Muslims in Andrzej's Word, World, what, and it was a bestseller after the Bosnian War, Huxford defends Andrzej by asserting that he was not familiar with the ideology of Eurocentrism and that he did not advocate for ethnic cleansing. Rather, for Huxford, the few Andrzej letters that speak about the movement of Muslim populations from Serbia are in reference to ethnic Albanian Muslims rather than Bosnian ones, and that Andrzej, then foreign affairs diplomat, made his recommendations in the context of the fluidity of orders following the Balkan Wars in the First World War. And I need to note here that her, um, the fault, uh, it's, it's beyond the scope here, but I do need to mention that it is crucial to point out that rather than identifying um, Kosova and Kosovars by their ethnic name, Huxworth labels them the Albanian Muslim population of southern Serbia, which is a rhetorical gesture that erases the, the you know, nation state aims of Kosovo at the time. Um, but the, the body movements of people, um, you know, in terms of, of cleansing, right, applied to those uh, ethnic Albanians in the south and southern Serbia. Another questionable area for Andrzej is the divisive nature of his academic and diplomatic writing. His unfinished doctoral degree <clears throat> was focused on the Islamization of Bosnia. And he writes, he didn't finish it obviously, but he writes that Bosnia was conquered by an Asiatic military people whose social institutions and customs spelled the negation of any and all Christian culture and whose religion begotten under other skies and social circumstances and quite incapable of adaptation, shackled the life of the spirit and the mind in Bosnia, disfiguring it and molding it into an exceptional case. So his doctoral thesis depicts the Ottoman conquest as a tragedy that halted Bosnian development and further deepened its distance from fully belonging to Western Europe. Contemporary Bosnian literary critics view his position as Orientalist and Eurocentric. For Andrzej, Bosnia's geographic position should have linked it with the lands along the Danube and the Adriatic Sea, but it's Islamization foreclosed the possibility Bosnia had to, quote, take part in the cultural development of a Christian Europe to which ethnographically and geographically it belonged. However, Andrzej affirms that the remarks in his doctoral thesis discuss the impact of Turkish rule in Bosnia and that they are not to be taken as criticism of Islamic culture as such, but only of the consequences of its transfer into a country that was Christian and Slavic. So his contemporary critique then is contextualized in a post-1989, um, post-1990s Southeastern Europe where national identities are further crystallized as the Ottoman history of the Southeastern Europe is assimilated under post-communist nationalist rhetoric. That is not to say that his position in relation to Islam is innocent, but we ought to be careful in our evaluation. Andrzej viewed Islamic culture in Bosnia as non-native and imposed and as a result, he understood Ottoman occupation as a signal moment in the development of that country, which deviated the course it ought to have followed, Christian and Western. So as scholars of the 21st century, we can clearly see the Orientalist and Islamophobic attitude in Andrzej's ideology. But if we remind ourselves that the Ottoman Empire was also an occupying force, Andrzej's resistance to its legacy can be understood as a resistance to a form of colonialism in the pre-modern and pre-capitalist era. It is a distant form of anti-colonialism that rejects Ottoman occupation and culture in order to assert itself and recuperate a lost bond of Bosnian origin, if, if there is such a thing. Um, what Andrzej fails to acknowledge in his assessment of the Bosnian situation, however, is that Bosnian conversion to Islam happened in large numbers by calling Bosnian Muslims Turks and even local Turks Andrzej places large portions of the Bosnian population under the rubric of other, foreign, occupier, and oppressor, thereby furthering and deepening the us and them binary um, and the Christian and Muslim binary within the community itself. His resistance toward the transformative power of the Ottoman rule in Bosnia in a pre-1989 milieu could be classified as anti-colonial. In a post-1989, post-Yugoslav context, however, his stance is problematic. Herein we face the limitations of the <coughs> colonial imperial studies that are as they are currently constituted. The reason for this is that the worlds Andrzej, Andrzej's novels represent are complex and compromised, uh, comprised of sedimented and imbricated colonial experiences. 
Why is it that his anti-colonial stance loses its momentum? Perhaps one reason is that aside from Ottoman colonialism, the nations were part of the former Yugoslav Republic. They experienced internal colonialisms, especially with Belgrade being the center of power, which marginalized other ethnicities within the Federation. Serbian desire to maintain control of different <coughs> former Yugoslav territories conflicted with the desire for independence for many nascent nation states. Resistance against Serb control is a form of internal anti-colonialism which pressed the situation into ethnic and religious conflict. And so we, where once anti-colonial resistance was located in the relationship between Southeast Europe and Ottoman rule, the location of the conflict in post-1989 Southeastern Europe has demonstrably shifted. The focus is no longer the Ottoman rule, but the religious and ethnic difference. No longer do Andrzej's texts exist that they affirm and inspire ethnic cleansing based upon religious difference. If the Ottoman legacy is rejected, the rejection is often scrutinized as Western Orientalism and Islamophobia. If the increasing Western European influence is rejected, the rejection is, is regarded as symptomatic of Southeastern European backwardness and otherness. So discursively, Southeastern Europe occupies both sides of this ideological seesaw. The worlds that Andrzej narrates in his novels represent this ideological and discursive impasse historically. His narratives and even have even and are even confounded at the impossibility to sort through sedimentations of colonial encounters and their mutations in southeastern Europe. The next case I would like to look at is the case of Ismail Federek, who also deals with the Ottoman Empire and yet not in a meticulous way as Andrzej did. Um, not a great deal of archival research, but a lot of his narratives, a great deal of his narratives are based on certain stories about occupation, the Ottoman occupation, and uh, certain narratives about sieges that have happened in the, the, the current the Albanian territories. Um, he's an Albanian writer. He won the Man Booker International Prize in 2006 and several others, um, very well known throughout the world, very well published. Um, but he deals with the Ottoman Empire in several novels, The Palace of Dreams being one of them, The Siege, another one, The Three Arched Bridge is another one. Um, and the one that I want us to look at today together is the, the siege itself. Because it is a, a curious novel in the sense that it was written initially in the 70s. Um, I have the original Albanian version of the 1981 issue. And then there was a republication later on in 2003, which was revised, um, extensively revised. Now the translation of this novel is uh, from the French, the translation in English is from the French, but this translation is mine here. So he has been criticized, Kader has been criticized from a good number of influential Albanian critics. In particular, Recep Chosya, he's a Kosovar Albanian academic who engaged in a public debate with Kader over Albanian's religious identity. And um, just, I'm gonna describe very briefly what that debate was. It took place in newspapers. Uh, so they would send, Kadare wrote an, an article in a newspaper about Albanian's uh, religious identity being Christian primarily. And then Recep Chosya comes back with another article in another publication and they go back and forth for several times. I believe each one of them has about three articles that, that, that was a very public debate. Since then, those articles have been published in little pamphlets that you can purchase. Um, so he's a very, Recep Chose is a very well-known academic, um, whereas Kadare claims that Albanians were Christian prior to Ottoman occupation and need to return to that heritage. Chosya vehemently rejects Kadare's position, arguing that Albanians are not just Christians, but also Muslim. And Chosya is coming from the perspective of the Kosovar experience. And if you recall, we talked about that intercolonization of the, the Yugoslav uh, Federation or, or of the ethnicities in the Yugoslav Federation. And Kosovar identity was cemented, unlike Albanian identity, was cemented through this religious difference <coughs> between the ruling Serbs and themselves. So that their identity was tethered very much to their, uh, to their ethnic identity, so their religious identity. Um, so Chosia is, uh, views Kadara stands as pernicious because it alienates Kosovar ethnic Albanians whose Muslim religion <clears throat> is central to their ethnic identity, a development that was the result of the internal colonization with Yugoslavia. So suffice it to say that the chosia kadara debate fueled many studies that interpreted Kadara's works in terms of Orientalist discourse. 
Qatar's disavowal and rejection of the Ottoman legacy um, in, in inspired critics within Albania, but also outside of Albania, to claim that he betrays a deeply racist and oriental stance toward the Ottoman other in an effort to improve Albania's chances to enter the EU. Right? So all those accusations have been, have been launched at him. Um, however, there is a time lag in Qatar's resistance to Ottoman legacy. Albania declared its independence from Ottoman rule in 1912, and yet a response to empire is not articulated in public discourse until the years after the fall of communism, the Albanian Renaissance intellectuals being an ex exception at the beginning of the 20th century. For Qadaret, communism was an extension of the oppressive nature of the Ottoman Empire, a stance that is quite explicit in his historical novels. In order to illustrate the problematics of his work, I will highlight these two passages. There's more, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight these two. Um, these are from The Siege. So the novel was published in 1970, and I, only, I, I don't have the original text, unfortunately, but I have the 1991 um, version of it. So um, we're going to look at and argue for a nuanced reading of the novel that accounts for its overt disavowal of the Ottoman legacy, which betrays the mimicry of Western Orientalism in the text. But such a reading ought to be genius based. It also must seek to read the Ottoman Empire as an occupying force and Kadera's text as resistance literature, in a sense. Such an approach accomplishes two things. First, it allows for a critical examination of already established scholarship on the Ottoman fiction in southeastern Europe, and then it opens up new territory for studies of empire, colonialism, etc. The novel is the story of a siege on an Albanian fortress, and the narrative focuses on the characters of the Ottoman camp. So it's told from the perspective of the Pasha, who's leading the siege against this fortress. It is interrupted regularly by short interchapter sections, which are recovered manuscripts, relaying the events as observed from within the castle walls. This narrative approach itself symbolizes resistance writing and a second perspective on the text. The following interchapter section narrates negotiations between Albanian leaders and representatives from the Ottoman army prior to the siege. So um, the, the 1981 passage reads this way, everyone would be allowed to keep their own faith. Their only request was that we give them the keys to the castle in order that from its highest peak, they would remove the red and black flag with a black bird on it. That's what they call our double-headed eagle which, according to their reasoning, insults the sky, and instead, as Allah had ordained, they would raise the flag of Islam with its half moon. The 2003 revised version reads this way. The conditions were clear. They would not touch anyone, would allow us to leave the castle along with our weapons and go wherever we pleased. They only asked for the keys to the castle in order to remove from its highest peak the flag of the black bird which, according to their reasoning, did not fit well with the sky, and in its place, they would raise the true daughter of the heavens, the half moon. This is what they have done everywhere lately. Their true intent for conquering is hidden behind a general idea. The religious issue was left for the end, assured that they would ultimately win. Pointing to the cross atop the castle, their leader said that as far that as far as the torture device, that's what they call the cross, if we wanted to, we could keep it along with Christianity, of course. He added that we would remove our religion ourselves later, for sure, because nobody could prefer Christian suffering compared to the peace of Islam. So we can see that there are substantial revisions in that 20, 2003 um, revision here. Um, as we can observe from these passages, the 1981 version emphasizes that the Ottoman intent was only to replace the, the eagle flag with the Islamic one. Such a replacement relies on the symbols of the flags themselves. The Albanian flag features the eagle and the Ottoman one, the crescent moon of the Islam. Thus, the 1981 passage sketches a difference between the two camps that does not religiously signify, at least not entirely. The eagle as a symbol of Albanian identity is under attack from the Ottoman army, and that eagle alone constitutes the identity of the people within the castle walls. The conflict appears to be more a national one rather than a religious one. Conversely, in the 2003 edition, it's heavily revised in order to include a second marker of difference, the cross, and the Christian faith directly at odds with Ottoman Islam. 
the 2003 version ostensibly couples national identity, the ego, with Christianity, the cross. The crescent moon is pitted against both, and therefore the ego and the cross are inseparable as symbols that represent ethnicity and religion, respectively, suturing ethnicity, uh, su suturing ethnicity and religion in this manner establishes a national identity that is incomplete without religious belonging. And in so doing, Kadara's text declared Christianity as the religion of Albanians. This is an essential rhetorical gesture for which Chosia criticizes Kadara's ideology and his revisions. In addition, national identity, as represented by the eagle, is a given, even though the story of the siege is set during the 15th century Ottoman incursions into southeastern European territories, a time when there were no nation states, nor were there na nascent uh, nationalisms. The resistance Ottomans were faced with in various kingdom, were various king kingdoms and principalities that would collaborate in their military resistance against the occupying force of the empire. Therefore, Kadare's historiography of in the siege before and after its post-communist revisions is marked by an understanding of the historical past through a presentist lens. His texts depict the Ottoman Empire as occupying an already established nation state rather than a territory fractured into multiple principalities. In Kadare's text, the present grafts itself onto the distant historical past, shortening the temporal, the, the distance by way of a geopolitical shortcut. The text assumes the burden of fleshing out history in order to explain the present moment of writing. And in so doing, Kadera's historical novels embody a quasi-mythical quality with enough historical references to lend them authority, but with even more narrative liberties that disregard the historical record. Kadera's depiction of the Ottoman occupation mirrors common narratives in Central Eastern Europe about the Ottoman Empire, and as such, his texts are translatable and ideologically fluent for a Western European audience. The, the siege is not only a story of the Ottoman army conquering South and Southeastern Europe, but it is a story of Southeastern European resistance as well. The figure of the Albanian chronicler in the small, is the small, feeble voice of resistance in the story. He reports on the leader's decision. Our answer was short and firm. Neither the eagle nor the cross would ever be removed from our firmament. They were symbols and the faith he had elected we would remain faithful to them. The point of view of the Albanian chronicler is the first person plural, we. A collective consciousness acting in unison, which is very different from the heterogeneous Ottoman camp, where the narrative is focalized on the Pasha, Chilebi, Sadedin, and the quartermaster, several other characters. The Albanian chronicler also betrays Orientalist attitudes when he states, what we saw spread out beneath us was Asia in all its mysticism and barbarity, a dark grave ready to swallow us all. Perhaps passages such as these show that in the present moment of writing, uh, what, what is at stake is the counter-narrative that resists the Ottoman legacy in a latent fashion. The collective we is also a clear demarcation of difference between them and us and them are clearly other, clearly foreign, and not Christian, and clearly invaders encroaching upon what the novel marks as Albanian territory. The Ottoman forces, too, have other foreign, have, are the other, the foreigners locked up in their high castle, and the Christians whose religion stands in opposition to the court. So the story center, then, is resistance, but it is a resistance that is activated on two different temporalities. The first temporality is that of the chronicler, with which the reader identifies. The second temporality is the contemporary one that expresses a latent resistance that is also Islamophobic. And the difficulty lies in the instability between these two temporalities as they shift in and out of the narrative center. And perhaps this is why the novel is compelling, because it demands that readers shift between temporalities, loyalties, and sympathies. And it is only in the chaos of such slippages that we can understand the complexity and nuance of the region. It is only in these slippages that we can evaluate the relationships of the peripheral of the provincial centers. And it is in these in these shifting temporalities that we can look at Southeastern Europe not just as this periphery that is part or an extension of the empire, but a provincial center of its own that produces its own knowledge, that it produces its own resistance even, um, however latent that is. And so I would like to focus my last remark on the hum 
of the Ottoman legacy. Um, and, and by hum, I'm, I'm, I'm primarily uh, using the example of the isopolyphony. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. Um, the isopolyphony being um, a form of song in, in several areas of southeastern Europe where you have uh, several voices. It's a very prized musical tradition in southeastern Europe. It's um, inspired by the notion of lamentation or by team. Uh, it has three voices. The base of the isopolyphony is the hum, which is it's just a, a, a vowel, a vowel a that is held as a drone um, in the background and throughout the whole song. And it's sung by the chorus. The second, the second voice, the first voice is called the taker, where the singer follows a particular rhythm and he, she, she, she sings the verses. Then there is the thrower, the third voice, that sounds almost like an echo of the taker uh, and mediates between the ladder and the drone. And so Southeastern Europe uh, consists, of, I see it much like the isopolyphony with all these other voices, the drone being the hum of the Ottoman Empire in, in the background. Um, and then we have the contemporary moment, which is the taker, the first voice. And then we have the mediating moment of the history that we do have accounted for. Um, so in Andrich, we, we observe these shifts as the novel's receptions change in the post-Yugoslav moment. While a desire for a return to Albania's Christian roots is a latent form of resistance fomented in a post-1989 and post-9-11 mm. moment in a nation that was seeking to join the EU, Hadera's works cannot be read in a singular way. So we have to look at them as resistance, but also these, these works that adhere to these Orientalist tropes at the same time. And so um, the answers that we seek perhaps can emerge through a careful analysis of the worlds within worlds within worlds, these relationships of the provincial centers of Southeastern European literature that, that, and the stories that they depict. And through accepting that um, and harmoniously incorporating into national identities the hum and the drone of the hauntings of history, not as inconvenient mm. truths, but as essential components of the polyphony of storytelling. Thank you. So now we have plenty of time. Who were the Christians? Who were the Christians? Yeah, that, that is, are they are they Eastern Christians or are they Roman Catholics? Um, uh, in, in which novel are, are, are you well, I mean, I mean in this, both of them? Uh, in the, yes, uh, so they would be both. They would be both. They would be Sorry. Catholic and Eastern Orthodox. In Albania, you would find primarily Eastern Orthodox, uh, unless you are speaking about Albanians uh, in the north, which would be more Catholic than the influence of, of the Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. No, are, there, are there comparable pressures and uh, features between those groups? Between the, the, the Catholics and Orthodox, in the literature itself, um, I haven't found any pressures like that. It, it's only between um, the Muslims and, and the Christians. Yeah. Well, the reason I asked that, that question is that uh, I think it was during the Bosnian War, uh, we had a very interesting medieval studies conference here in the Slavic world. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of uh, scholars working independently uh, managed to show up with kind of the the same narrative and the uh, the narrative ran roughly uh, well um, it was conquest mm -hmm. and uh, if your if your conqueror was uh, Turkish or Muslim you were you were Muslim yes. right uh, yeah. if it were uh, Eastern Orthodox you were you were Byzantine, right? It was, it was from the West. You know, you suddenly found yourself there. That is uh, the um, uh, you know, it was um, it was in the vein of hostile takeovers, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Administrative changes, uh, which in a way, you know, in in the context of that conference, really undercut the uh, uh, radical claim. Right, that there was a sort of last stronghold of Western Christianity holding yes. out. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. uh, they've been they've been shifting back and forth all yes. along. Yeah, I mean, does that does that sort of line up with what you're more recent? Um, research? Yeah, well, what, what you see actually the, the latest research that I found on the Ottoman Empire is from a friend Harsh. He wrote a, a Islamic history of the Ottoman Empire, and he talks about the Ottoman Empire 
And part of what he writes about the Ottoman Empire is that they came into the region and they did not necessarily force people to convert. Um, but as Christians obviously had fewer rights in, in this particular context. And so um, a great deal of, of, of Christians converted to Islam to avoid the blood tax primarily, where their children were taken in, into assemble for the army. And so um, in a sense, yeah, there, there is that, that part of, of conquest right, that comes with, okay, I guess we are under this banner now. Right? <coughs> but then you also did have um, certain, certain strongholds, and it says that you had certain individual principalities, and I'm thinking of you know, the Albanian um, National Bureau, uh, Senderbeck, right, his principality held on, but we also have narratives from uh, an historical record from Bulgaria, for instance, where they really resisted um, the Ottoman takeover, and, and, and um, even though a large number of Bulgarians too converted as well. So I think, I don't think that we can say that it was either people just accepted these, these banners that came um, and, and occupied their lands, Fully, or that they rejected them fully. I think we have we have a variety of responses, um, and I think the religious makeup of of southeastern Europe speaks to that variety of responses. Yes. One sort of a follow up question to Bob: so the term Christian, I and mean, as you showed, Andrich seems to use that word sort of interchangeably with Serbs, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, how does that leave the Croats? Are they just assumed under this uh -huh. Serbo-Croatian label, or is there a sense that nevertheless there is a difference between right. Serbs and Croats? And, then, and that's, a, that's a criticism that, that is dislodged at Andrich too, because um, he so he he was born in Bosnia, in Bosnia territory, right, and then he moved to Belgrade, right, which was um, which was believed to be a, a very strategic move politically and, and in terms of his career but that his concern was not so much with um, the other ethnicities, like the Croats, for instance. Um, he considered himself Bosnian, but then took up the, the banner, if you will, of, of, the Serbian, of the Serbian identity. And so um, there isn't a lot in the literature that I see where he addresses the Croats um, in, in his writing. This, these are small Bosnian towns, and. Um, you know, the, the main conflict that he has experienced himself as a Christian uh, in Muslim mm -hmm. is between these Muslim um, communities and the Serbs. Yeah, um, I found it interesting that in the beginning you were sort of talking about the present situation mm -hmm. as well. Specifically Turkey's, I think you call it, larger goals. Mm -hmm. and, and to me that's interesting because this is sort of a reflection of, of the fundamental constellation that, that we have in the Balkan states, where there's always been a long history of negotiating national identity, religious identity, mm -hmm. and political aims. Mm -hmm. And now, with the EU specifically in mind, this, I think, is, is just a repetition of, of, of that history. And I was wondering how your take is on, on this very precarious situation between Turkey on the one hand, who always, you know, sort of uh, has this ambition of, of entering into the EU, and then states like Kosovo, and of course the, the former Yugoslav states will also have these ambitions, but on the other hand have this very interesting interrelationship with Turkey. Mm -hmm. So how does this play out between the two, or three or four? Um, well, in the case of Kosovo, they, they did make those revisions, right? Because Kosovo, I think they are lacking a few number of states to recognize them as an independent nation state. And so, of course, Turkey is, is one of their allies, and, and they, they view them as such. So those, um, those historical changes mm -hmm. were made in the textbooks. Um, in terms of the other nations in the region, I think you know, the tension is not so much between the other nations and Turkey, although the, from, from my research what emerges is this um, unease with the economic power that Turkey has in, in southeastern Europe. There's a lot of investments, and anybody who has gone or, or lived or been to southeastern Europe will see that a great deal of, of, of companies from Turkey have invested, uh, and so there is economic power there. Um, but the, the articles I was referencing, they were more nervous about the religious power that Turkey was having in, in these particular areas rather than the economic power. 
um, which I found that curious, right? Because at one point, the Ottoman Empire was holding the this, this scepter of, uh, of, of, of Islam in the world, right? Um, and then there are those in, in the political milieu of Turkey currently who would like to see that again, right, as the, as the leader of that Islamic world. Could you talk a bit about the readership uh, of these two passages and of the text as a whole? In addition to the critics whom you cited, uh, was there a general, more popular readership? Was there a widespread acceptance of the dichotomized representation here? Was there a widespread sense of the shift in the representation, for example, of Christianity in the second one in contrast to the yeah. first one? Or was it more a question of a certain segment of intelligentsia, that mm -hmm. sort of thing? That would have I'm very glad you asked it. I didn't have time to include it in <clears throat> this part. But the, the, the book itself, as I mentioned, is, is translated into English from the French mm -hmm. by David Bellis. And, and it's afterward, David Bellis states that these changes that have been incorporated into the 2003 edition are ones that were made as a result of now being free from censorship, right? Because during communist times, a lot of the religious discourse was, was banned, right? The mosques and churches, uh, religion was banned, in other words. And so uh, that was just the justification of the, of the translator for that particular, for those particular changes. Um, and, then, and I think that is a valid one, um, not to a point, right? That there, there might have been censorship, Kadari might have been very uh, <coughs> concerned about the kind of problems that might arise by including this religious uh, language in the passage itself. Now, in terms of the, the changes that were made um, to the 2003 and the readership here, um, the ones that I have, I have come across, the criticism that I've come across has been from local, uh, from local individuals in Albania, local critics, lo local journalists and scholars. Not so much for the, from the general readership itself. Uh, this has been more in terms of a scholarly study of these passages, what changes are made, and what the implications of those changes are. Okay. Hi. Thanks for your talk. Um, so obviously uh, religion is really a key for the writers that you discuss. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask you about what's missing, <laughs> uh, which is the other big driving force of nationalism, which is language. Mm -hmm. Right? So they're trying to establish kind of national narratives mm -hmm. and differential narratives on the basis of religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, at least from what you presented, not including language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back to this question of the Croats and the Serbs, right? And this incredible ideological struggle over whether there is such a thing as Serbo-Croatian and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that today. Uh, and uh, the homogenization of language key to 19th century uh, national uh, uh, unifications. Mm -hmm. And then there's another southeastern uh, European writer, uh, Ilora Pavic, mm -hmm. who, you know, in the Dictionary of Khazars, does make that his central, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not a bridge, it's a dictionary, mm -hmm. it's a multilingual dictionary that, right. you know, no one can completely use and we've lost the definitions mm -hmm. and all that. So I'm just wondering, uh, and then um, language seems also crucial to this, your attempt to insert province between metropole and, and periphery, in the sense that in the periphery, a multiplicity of languages are spoken, and the metropolitan language may, is almost always in the minority, whereas in the province, you would expect more linguistic homogeneity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on, on yeah, that. Yeah. So in terms of the, the organization of the Ottoman Empire in these, in these provinces, um, research shows that the, primarily it was the urban centers where you had Turkish officials that would speak um, Turkish, whereas in the rural areas where the majority of the population lived, you had, uh, you had people speak their own language, their own tongue. And in that sense, the periphery or the, the, the rural areas, the non the non urban areas, they they had that homogeneity of language. And only in these in these town centers did, did you have the, the, the Turkish language. And Kadare primarily Kadare does not deal with, with the linguistic aspect at all. Um, he he just 
tells us a straight up narrative that is interrupted by these uh, chronicles of the people of, of, in the siege. Whereas in Andrich, you will you will see um, you know you will see Bosnian dialect in it as well as Serbian dialect. So he does kind of mix that in in the, in the text itself. I know in interviews, Hedari has really insisted that the Ottoman influence on Albanian is like inauthentic, and I think he's argued that it's grammatically incompatible. Yes. And then he goes back to like this affinity with ancient Greek that is sort of preserved in some aspects of Albanian. I was wondering then if there's an attempt to go back to like a pure Albanian in this passage, because there's some aspects of the rewriting, like it salts the sky becomes, uh, doesn't fit well with the sky. So it seems like there's also a linguistic or literary aspect that's influencing this reading. Are you looking at the first passage or the second passage? In the first passage, it says that the, the double-headed eagle insults the sky, and then in 2003, yes. according to their reason, it did not fit well with the sky. That was just one thing that caught my eye, but I was wondering what yes, other no, practices that's, 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 that's um, I don't have the, the books here, and I would love to, to actually address this with the, with the original Albanian language. But maybe I can do that after the talk, but I do get a hold of the books. And there is, uh, these are my translations. So, um, and if I've translated this as um, it insults the sky, it's because there is an actual difference from, from, the, from the original 1981 edition than the 2001 edition. And you're absolutely right, but there are views um, the Ottoman or the Muslim conversion as inauthentic, right? That, that we were forced, that, that Albanians were forced to convert, um, and, a, and it, wasn't, it wasn't willingly. Um, but when we're looking at historical record, that, that is not entirely true. A lot of these conversions happened because it was, it was one of those things that made life easier. Um, if we're reading Stavriano's work on the Balkans um, since 1453, a good number of conversions were very willing. And in fact, some people would try to give their children to, uh, to the Ottoman army uh, because they would get a better education. Uh, a better chance at life, and, 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 and even get land after their, their um, uh, army excursions um, elsewhere in the, in the empire. So, um, but he is very much concerned with this pure original identity that he's trying to recover, and part of him, his desire to tether Albanian, um, and, and, and the, it has been part of his discourse, right, that Albania is as ancient as Greece, right? There's, there's always this tendency in order to describe mm -hmm. it in this way. Um, and so that linguistic affinity that he, he is trying to draw out is, um, is for that purpose as well. Um, although I know that linguists disagree with, with his linguistic analysis as well as do some historians um, who are looking at the historical record on, on conversion. Yes. Um, what is it about this historical moment? So you said that this was written in 1917? Right. Yes. Um, so, what is it about um, this historical moment that renders this kind of anti-colonial critique mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, more urgent or necessary? Um, would you say that there was a trend? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, towards like more historical novels, or were they influenced by other anti-colonial writers around the world? Were there any interactions? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, first of all, in the seventies and eighties. We wouldn't have been talking, at least in Albania, they wouldn't have been talking in terms of colonialism mm -hmm. and, and, and the kind of discourse that, that I am, I am I'm attempting to use here. But uh, the, the images for writing in this manner was because um, in, the, in the aftermath of World War II, once the Communist Party took over, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, once the Communist Party took over, uh, the, uh, the Communist the communist propaganda spoke against the Ottoman Empire as something retrograde and backward, <clears throat> and as something that halted our civilization, Albanian civilization, and also Southeastern civilization. And so this was in line with the kind of work that were expected to be written about the Ottoman Empire as well. So it, it kind of fell in, in line with the kind of propaganda that was being spoken by the powers that be at the time. We are running out of time. Thank you very much.